Thank you for taking the time to watch our training video. This video will focus on the acquisition of Click and Tonebirds ABRs using SmartEP in adults and older children. If you are recording ABRs in pediatric patients, I encourage you to watch our pediatric ABR training video, which will include specific recommendations for pediatric patients. This training video will provide a complete overview on best practices for recording ABRs using the IHS SmartEP system. We will begin with the testing area and the equipment setup, then cover the settings and parameters, the patient setup and electrode montage. After an overview of the SmartEP software interface, we will show you how to acquire and analyze recordings and finish with report generation. The American Academy of Audiology Practice Guidelines Assessment of Hearing in Infants and Young Children from January 2020 emphasize that the testing area for ABR assessment must be a quiet room or sound-treated booth, and that if performed with sedation or anesthesia, the surgery center, a procedure room, or operating room are permissible. This also applies when testing adult patients. The IHS Duet Smart EP system has been used successfully by our customers to record ABRs in all of these settings. It is important that when using a cart, the Duet be connected to an isolation transformer and that the cart be grounded. The space and power supply must be free of excessive electrical noise and the space should include a recliner or bed for the patient to sleep comfortably. Avoid metal beds and recliners. Proper ground connections are crucial for ABR recordings. When setting up the testing area, it is important that the equipment be grounded or connected to an earth ground. Any metal surface must also be grounded. For more details on reducing electrical interference, I invite you to view our video on the subject. The Duet is an FDA-cleared two-channel auditory evoke potential device. We also offer the option to use it as a one-channel device for ABR testing with automatic switching of the polarity for the customers who prefer using only three electrodes. It can be used with any Windows 10 PC, such as a laptop shown on the screen. You will also see the back view of the Duet on the right, showing all the connectors that are clearly labeled. We offer two types of two-channel electrode cables. On the left is a Duet 5 electrode lead, to which snap leads, reusable gold or silver cup electrodes, or leaded electrodes can be connected. This cable has five inputs, two negative inputs and two positive inputs, as well as a ground input in black. The negative or inverting input for the right channel is red, and the positive or non-inverting is white. The negative or inverting input for the left channel is blue, and its positive, non-inverting input is gray. The two positive or non-inverting inputs can be joined together using a Y adapter or jumper cable. Please remember to always keep your electro leads braided to minimize noise contaminants. The Duet 4 snap lead cable is intended to be used with disposable snap electrodes and has two negative or inverting connections, one red and one blue, a ground connection in black, and one positive or non-inverting, the white snap, since two positive connections are joined internally. The one-channel electrode cables have three inputs. The white is always positive or non-inverting. The ground and negative or inverting polarity switch from the red and the blue position depending on which ear is stimulated. You can use the snap lead, reusable gold or silver cup electrodes, leaded electrodes with the three electrode lead cable and only disposable snap electrodes with the snap lead cable pictured on the right. We use 300 ohm ER3C insert earphones with a duet, which you will see on the left. On the right, you will see the ER3A insert earphones. Most new Duet devices ship with the newer Radio Ear B81 bone oscillator pictured on the left. The Radio Ear 300 ohm B71 bone conductor, which was supplied until the release of the B81, can also be used. Since both models have different calibration tables, please be sure to select the correct transducer in the software. 
If you are interested in using the B81, but have the B71, please contact the technical support team to ensure compatibility with your device. In the past, we supplied the TDH49 300 ohm headphones pictured on the right. As this model is being discontinued by Telefonics, we now offer the Radio Ear DD45 pictured on the left. The supplies you will need include electrodes, either disposable or those that can be disinfected, skin preparation gels, alcohol prep pads, electrode conduction creams or pastes, surgical tape, gauze squares, variety of single-use or disinfectable earphone tips, an otoscope, and specula. Disposable electrodes are recommended for infection control. IHS has validated the equipment with the Ambu Neuroline disposable electrodes and recommends these electrodes. Please be sure that your disposable snap electrodes are kept in an airtight sealed bag, that they are less than a year old and are not expired. The electrodes are pre-gelled and should not be dry before you start using them. Fresh electrodes will have gel on the center sponge. Reusable gold cup electrodes as well as clip electrodes can also be used. Please be sure these are clean and not tarnished. Electrode prep creams such as new prep or electrode prep pads can be used to prepare the skin for electrode application. For centers that are required to use single-use items for skin preparation, we highly recommend the electrode prep pads pictured here. More than an alcohol pad, these pads have pumice, which helps reduce impedance. 1020 conductive paste can be used with reusable electrodes. EEG conductive gel, such as a spectrogel, can be added to the disposable electrodes to improve conductivity. Every ear canal is unique, with different lengths, shapes, and openings. Examine the ear canal for obstruction or excessive cerumen. Visually determine for each ear canal which ear tip size is required. Choosing the right ear tip is important to ensure proper sound delivery. The ear tip should be small enough for appropriate insertion down the ear canal and sufficiently large for a good seal to block out the sound. Foam ear tips are recommended for most uses. They are available in three sizes. Standard, eight to 13 millimeter. Small, six to nine millimeter. And large, 10 to 14 millimeter. Most adults will use the standard size. Most pediatric patients and adults with smaller ear canals will use a small size. Adults with larger ear canals may require the use of the larger ear tips. Electrophysiologic evoke potential evaluation, such as a tone burst ABR, can be used to determine the presence and type of hearing loss in newborns and infants, a child of any age who is incapable of providing accurate information for behavioral tests, or who has yielded behavioral test results that are not reliable or are incomplete. ABRs can be evoked using click and tone bursts. Click ABR is used for neurological auditory neurosynchrony assessments, such as in the diagnosis of auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder. Click stimuli do not provide frequency specific information and should not be substituted for tone bursts for diagnostic audiometric purposes. Tone burst ABRs are used in threshold assessments. These are evoked using short duration tones of 6 millisecond durations called tone bursts or pips with frequencies from 500 Hz to 4000 Hz with a Blackman window function. The parameters are stored in the SmartDP software as settings file. Sample settings files are provided with the machine and can be loaded via the load settings option in SmartDP, which we'll review later in this video. We will use a 5 millisecond duration for the 500 and 1000 Hz tones, a 2.5 millisecond for 2000 Hz tone, and a 1.25 millisecond 4000 Hz tone, presented at 21.7 or 27.7 per second. We use an alternating polarity for the tone bursts. 
standard threshold search procedures should be employed starting at 50 or 60 dB NHL. If a clear response is seen, decrease the intensity in 20 dB steps using an up 10 down 20 bracketing procedure to determine threshold. Threshold determination below 15 to 20 dBHL is generally not necessary. It's also reasonable for experienced clinicians to begin testing at screening levels, 35 to 40 dB, in order to quickly identify normal and near normal thresholds. If a response is not clearly observable, increase the intensity by 20 dB steps until clearly observed and continue the bracketing procedure. The recording bandwidth is from 100 to 1500 Hz for the adult ABR settings. The high pass filter should be 100 Hz when testing older children and adults where EMG noise is likely present. When testing infants, the high pass filter can be set to 30 Hz. The low pass filter is set to 1500 and can be also set to 3000 Hz. The amplifier is set to 100,000 amplification. The notch filter, 60 Hz or 50 Hz depending on where you're located, is turned off but can be activated to reduce line noise when needed. Sweeps are the sample size or number of repetitions. The more you average, the more likely you will eliminate noise and increase response clarity. Commonly used sweep counts include 1024 for clicks and 2048 for toneverse ABR. A minimum of 1000 sweeps is always needed to ensure a stable response. Reliability can be evaluated by repeating an average at least once or by the use of valid response detection criteria such as SNR and residual noise or FSP. At threshold or if a patient is noisy, more sweeps, 4,000 to 6,000 or more, may be necessary to achieve a quality response in which the waveform is clear. Under sedation, fewer sweeps should be necessary in general. Given time limitations, response repetition can be used only as necessary to clarify the presence or absence of a response. The recording analysis window should be a minimum of 20 milliseconds and is set to 25.6 milliseconds in our settings file. Here are the parameters for the click ABR settings. Click ABRs are recorded using a high level 80 dB NHL, for example, 100 microsecond click stimulus in either or both of the two single polarities, rarefaction or condensation, at a rate between 11 to 27, for example, 11.7 or 27.7 per second for each ear. The slower rate will enhance wave one. The recording bandwidth is again from 100 to 3000 Hz for the adult click ABR settings. The amplifier is set to 100,000 amplification. The notch filter, 60 or 50 Hz depending on where you're located, is turned off but can be activated to reduce line noise when needed. 1000 sweeps will be recorded for each polarity. The recording analysis window is set to 12.8 milliseconds. Patient preparation is an important factor in optimizing the conditions for recording ABRs. Patients should sleep soundly for a prolonged period of time to obtain clean, low noise electrophysiologic recordings. Natural sleep is best, but when this cannot be assured, sedation is necessary. Most of the clinics using the IHS Duet with Smart AP perform ABRs in the clinic with natural sleep and no sedation. Make sure the skin is clean. Skin that is too dry, too oily, or flaky may affect impedance. Prepare the skin for electrode application with new prep on a gauze pad or an electrode prep pad with pumice. Carefully clean and mildly abrade the skin using small circles in the locations where you'll be placing the electrodes. The electrodes are pre-gelled and should not be dry before you start using them. To obtain the most ideal impedance, especially on delicate skin that cannot be abraded, IHS recommends the use of spectrogel in addition to the gel already on the electrode. Place a small drop of spectrogel on a gauze pad. You can also use the backing of the electrode. 
Use a small dab of spectrogel in the center of the electrode sponge. You can proceed with placing the electrode without adding extra gel as well. When placing the electrode, press down around the sponge to secure the electrode in place. Do not press in the center of the electrode as this can spread the gel and make the electrode come loose. Electrode placement is as follows. The electrode connected to the positive, non-inverting connection on the amplifier should be at midline, preferably vertex, CZ, or high forehead, FPZ. The negative, inverting electrode should be applied to the mastoids or earlobes. Earlobe electrodes will minimize interference when testing by bone conduction. Earlobe electrodes will also help enhance wave one. When recording in dual channel mode using the five electrode lead cable, the two positive non-inverting inputs are joined together using a Y adapter or jumper cable. The electrode connected to the red input will be placed on the right earlobe or mastoid and the electrode connected to the blue input will be placed on the left earlobe or mastoid. The ground electrode will be placed on the low forehead. In the amplifier settings window of the software, channel A, which is the red input on the cable, will have a channel designation as right, and channel B, which is the blue input on the cable, will have a channel designation as left. When recording in single channel mode using the three lead one channel cable, the red electrode will be placed on the right mastoid or earlobe, and the blue electrode lead will be placed on the left mastoid or earlobe. The negative and ground will switch from the right to the left ear, and the white electrode will remain the positive, non-inverting connection, which will be placed at midline, preferably vertex CZ or high forehead FPZ. In the amplifier settings window of the software, only channel A will be active. The channel designation should be set to right-left, which will activate the automatic polarity switching from the negative to the ground. This means that when you're testing the left ear, the electrode connected to the left ear and blue input will be negative, and the one connected to the right ear and red input will be ground. When you're testing the right ear, the electrode connected to the right ear and red input will be negative, and the one connected to the left ear and black input will be ground the white input will always remain positive, or the non-inverting electrode. When recording in single channel mode using the five electrode lead cable, the red electrode will be placed on the right mastoid or earlobe, and the electrode connected to the black input will be placed on the left mastoid or earlobe. The negative and ground will switch from the right to the left ear, and the white electrode will remain the positive non-inverting connection which will be placed at midline, preferably vertex, CZ, or high forehead, FPZ. In the amplifier settings window of the software, only channel A will be active. The channel designation should be set to right-left, which will activate the automatic polarity switching from the negative to the ground. This means that when you're testing the left ear, the electrode connected to the left ear and black input will be negative, and the one connected to the right ear and red input will be the ground. When you're testing the right ear, the electrode connected to the right ear and red input will be negative, and the one connected to the left ear and black input will be ground. The white input will always remain the positive or non-inverting electrode. The electrode impedance should be no more than 5 kilo ohms between any electrode pair and should be matched across pairs within 1 kilo ohms. The impedance at each position should be lower than 7 kilo ohms. Once electrodes are in place, ensure that the patient is comfortable and hopefully sleeping. It is important to place the electrodes first to improve the impedance and therefore our signal quality. To obtain the noise exclusion and interaural attenuation, earphone insertion depth should be 14 to 15 millimeters into the ear canal. This depth is achieved when the outside edge of the foam ear tip is 2 to 3 millimeters inside the entrance to the ear canal. Insert the black tubing of an ER3 foam ear tip completely onto the adapter of the sound delivery tube. 
To facilitate proper placement, firmly roll the foam ear tip into the smallest diameter possible. Insert the ear tip into the ear canal. When the outside edge of the ear tip is two to three millimeters inside the entrance of the ear canal, allow the foam to expand to acoustically seal the ear canal. Hold or press the ear tip in place until it expands. If the correct insertion depth cannot be achieved, try rolling the foam into a smaller diameter before insertion. If unsuccessful, use a different size ear tip. If the seal is inadequate, try another ear tip. The amplitude of ABR responses range from about 0.1 to 1 microvolt. ABRs are extracted from EEG background noise in the range of 10 to 100 microvolts. The Duet amplifier design allows us to record cleaner, more robust responses with increased signal to noise ratio and low residual noise. But to optimize our recording quality and make sure we can acquire the best possible recordings, it's important to make sure our equipment and patient are set up properly and that our testing area and conditions are optimal. I will share with you a few quick tips that we have found help reduce interference and optimize testing conditions. First and foremost, make sure you have a grounded connection. Ensure that all system components are on and connected properly. Components should be away from all electrical devices. If there are any other devices that are connected to the same electrical outlet or circuit, make sure to disconnect any other device that does not have ground connections. I have visited some clinics experiencing noisy recordings on their ABR equipment, and once I disconnected other devices such as an LED lamp or a hearing aid charger that had power cables with no ground connections from the power strip or another outlet that shared the same electrical circuit that completely eliminated the noise. On grounded devices, those with two prong connectors as shown on the left here, can be an avoidable source of noise. Make sure all devices connected to the same power source as a duet, including your computer, have three prong grounded connectors as shown in the green circle. Avoid placing the equipment on metal surfaces. If using a cart with metal components, Make sure the cart is grounded. Some additional tips include separating cables from each other. Avoid having the transducers touching the patient cable. One way to do this is to have the insert earphones coming from the top of the bed or recliner and the electrode cable from the bottom. Make sure your electrode lead cables are not older than a year and are braided, that your electrodes are not expired and conductive, and that you are using the correct montage. Also make sure the impedance is low and balanced. If necessary, move the electrode cable around until you locate a low noise location in the patient's testing setup area. The EEG signal shown on the EEG and amplifier settings window and in the EEG viewing panel should not appear to be cyclical or repeatable in nature and should have a very small amplitude. Activating the line filter will help reduce the effect of 60 Hz or 50 Hz line noise as shown on the screen below. This should only be done if environmental noise cannot be eliminated. On the left side, you will see an example of the EEG of a patient in a calm and optimal state, where the incoming EEG signals are small in amplitude and within the artifact acceptance region. The example on the right is for the EEG of a patient in a very active, poor state. The EEG signals are also within the red shaded area, which means they're going to be rejected. Now, we will switch gear and launch the SmartEP software for an overview of the SmartEP software interface. This is a SmartEP software program. Below the streamlined menus in the user-friendly interface of SmartEP, you will find large accessible buttons on the toolbar that provide easy access to the most commonly used functions. As you hover over each button, a description of its function will be displayed. We will go through each button later on in the training. At the bottom of the screen, you will find a simplified control panel. 
This panel provides direct main screen access to change any parameter. To quickly begin a test, you can click on Load Settings and choose from a list of pre-configured test protocols. You can also easily modify any parameter right from the control panel without needing to go into submenus or other windows. For parameters with set options, simply click on the item to toggle through the available options. For example, with a single click on the ear button, I can change from left to right or both ears. You can switch the polarity of the stimulus with a single click, going from rarefaction to condensation or alternating. For other parameters, you can double click to enter specific values. To change the number of sweeps, double click and enter a value. And the same can be done for the rate. Right clicks and left clicks will also allow you to modify the values. A right click on intensity will increase the intensity by 10, and a left click brings it down by 10, or the step size selected in the software. And you may also double click on intensity to enter a specific value. A single click on stim will open the stimulus generation utility. The amplifier button on the right side of the screen opens the amplifier settings window where you can modify the amplifier settings, such as the gain, high pass, and low pass, and activate the line filter. The recordings will appear in the large white space. You can choose to activate or hide a low profile grid on the page by clicking on the set page button or on the page number which can be found on the right of the white space. Clicking on each page, you will also be able to customize page attributes such as a scale, page name, and much more. The ACQ page is the acquisition page from which you will always be recording. The page settings for the acquisition page are saved in the settings files, including the sample settings we provide. We provide a set of pediatric audiology page labels, which I will load up and save as my default. Now, you will notice that the page names have changed. We will talk about the other pages when we discuss report generation later in the video. Right below the menus, you will find a toolbar with various shortcut icons for easy access to often used features. Later in the video, during the recording acquisition section, we will go into more detail on the function of each icon. Shortcuts to create and access patient records, label recordings, load and save recordings, applying filters, arranging recordings, save and printing recordings, adding notes, and the user's manual. So, let's begin recording. First, I will create a new patient file by clicking on the new patient icon on the top left and entering the patient's information. You can enter as much or as little information on your patient as you want beyond the first and last name fields which are required. If you wish to enter a medical record number, please enter it in the main ID field. The EEG button on the right side of the screen opens a viewing panel for the incoming EEG. This panel can be displayed or hidden at any time. Before beginning acquisition, the impedance can be checked on the screen. The value for each electrode as well as the time the impedance is checked is displayed. The blue line represents the incoming EEG and the red shaded area is the artifact rejection region. When the blue line goes in the red area, the sweeps will be rejected and when it stays in the white area, the sweeps will be accepted. Now, 
I'll click on Load Settings and select my Click ABR Settings file, and I'm ready to begin. I set my intensity to 80 by double clicking and click on Acquire. To select a waveform, you can click on the waveform or on a circle on the left of the waveform. Once a waveform is selected, you can move it up and down the screen by dragging it or by using the up and down arrow keys on the keyboard. During acquisition, the number of sweeps will appear on the top left with the number of rejections next to it. You can label the peaks at any time during or after acquisition and even work on one waveform while acquiring another. While I'm working to label one recording, I'll begin acquisition from my left ear so I can multitask. To mark the peaks, first make sure the waveform you're trying to label is selected. Selected waveforms are green in color. Click on the label for the peak you are trying to mark, then click right above or below the waveform where you would like to place it. Once the peak label is placed, you will notice there are two triangles. One at the top facing down and the other at the bottom facing up. The top marker is a latency marker and the bottom marker is the amplitude marker. You can adjust the position of either marker by either clicking and dragging the marker or using the keyboard. To move the latency marker, use the right and left arrow keys and to move the amplitude marker, use the right or left arrow keys while holding down the Alt key. I'm going to repeat the recordings and while it's recording, I'm going to click on the Reg Info button on the right side of the screen to open the Embedded Recording Information panel. This panel provides easy access to very useful information about each recording. You can choose to keep it open at all times or use it as needed. I can select one recording either by clicking on the recording as we did earlier or by selecting a recording from the drop-down menu on the panel. When you have many recordings on the screen, you can also use the S key as a shortcut to cycle through the recordings. Once a recording is selected, and if you have labeled your peaks, the peak information appears in the peak tab of the panel. Here, you'll find the latency and amplitude of each labeled peak, as well as the intrapeak latencies. Switch to the response tab to find more information about the quality of the recording. Along with the signal to noise ratio, or SNR, and residual noise, RN, we also provide a cross-correlation indication of repeatability of the response within itself based on the calculation region. FSP and FMP values can be calculated when recording in blocks. This can be activated in the averaging menu. As I continue recording, I want to draw your attention to the right side of the screen as we discuss some of the display features. You can easily zoom the recordings in and out using the zoom buttons, plus zooms in and minus zooms out. A horizontal baseline can also be shown for each recording, and this can be activated from the show menu. Another display option you may find useful is the ability to show the latency and amplitude of a recording right on the waveform. For those of you who look for the cochlear microphonic, you may find it useful to set your display to start from negative 2 milliseconds. You can change the display time window from the set page menu or by right clicking on your page. Since I have multiple recordings with the same parameters on the page, I will take the opportunity to walk you through adding two recordings. First, select the recordings you want to add by clicking on one holding down the control key and selecting the other. You will notice that both of the circles on the left of the recordings are filled, meaning they are selected. To create a grand average or add both, you can go to the process menu and then add selected. There is another option for which I will use the other side's recordings. Select both recordings, then using the keyboard, 
press and hold the shift and plus keys. Note that the averaged waveform appears bolded. You can move it up and down using the arrow keys to separate it from the other recordings. In the recording panel, you will see in the comments that this recording is a sum of two recordings and the number of sweep totals the number of sweeps in the first plus the second one. Notice that I have the stimulus information activated for my recordings. If you prefer to use this as well, you can activate it in the show menu by going to show recording label and clicking on stimulus information. Some sites prefer to have the extra information while others do not need it. Once you finish with one type of recording, if you want to move to another type of recording, you can easily move the recordings from the acquisition page to another page by right clicking on the current page and selecting send all data on this page to page and choosing your destination page. In this case, I will move the data from the acquisition page to my click page. You can also use a set page button to do the same. Using the feature will move the recordings and all the atoms on the page as you have arranged them and make it easier for you to build your report. When testing infants, it is not uncommon to test one ear first, going through all the frequencies and then proceeding to the other ear. Using this feature, you can easily move the right ear recordings to their corresponding pages first and then switching to the left ear, sending the left ear recordings to the pages. And you will have the recordings arranged with the right ear recordings on one side and the left ear recordings on the other side. This makes preparing and generating your report a smooth process. Right now, I'll go ahead and click on load settings and choose my 4000 Hz tone burst settings. The stimulus is set to be presented continuously, and so it is set by default to a low intensity. Some clinics start recording at 50 or 60 dB, and others prefer to start at the estimated threshold. It is up to you. To set the intensity, I double click on the intensity button and enter 60, then begin. After the acquisition has begun, the acquire button turns into a pause button that you can click to pause. You can also use the space bar on the keyboard to pause acquisition. Pausing the recording is useful. If you need the patient to settle down again once you're ready to proceed, you can click on yes to continue. If you wanted to stop the recording altogether, you would select no. I'm going to lower the intensity and start acquiring again. On the right of the pause stop button is a restart button. This button will stop the current acquisition and restart the sweeps all in one click. It is particularly useful when testing babies as a quick way to restart the test if you have a noisy recording. When you have a recording selected and it is green, as you move along the recording, if you look on the top of the screen, you'll be able to see where you are in time. I will label the peaks as we did before, while the recording is in progress. Note that you can also adjust the placement of any peaks at any time. You simply need to click on the label, it will become red, and then you can move the latency and amplitude markers as needed. I will continue recording, and while I'm recording, I will go over some of the buttons on the toolbar. I will go from left to right describing the function of each icon. The left icon allows you to create a patient file, and the button next to it to open an existing patient file. Next, you will find the peak labels that apply to the type of auditory evoke potential you are recording. Here, since we are in ABR mode, we have the labels for peaks 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. The next icon allows you to load a recording, save a single recording, or save multiple recordings. All recordings are automatically saved upon completion, but these buttons will allow you to manually save recordings that have been manipulated. Next, we have an option to toggle between a split page and a full page display. The next button allows you to apply a filter to the recording, for example, a smoothing filter. The I, 
O and F buttons allow you to quickly arrange recordings by intensity, I, order of acquisition, O, or frequency, F. Clicking on I will overlap recordings that have the same intensity. You can use the buttons during and after acquisition. You can also arrange recordings by rate by typing the R key. The next button opens the latency intensity function, which will automatically be plotted based on the recordings that have been labeled on your page. You can add notes to the page. The last sets of buttons are used to save a report or load a previously saved report, as well as printing or generating a PDF of the report. For those of you who often fax reports, we have a feature to increase the thickness of the waveform to make them more visible when they are printed. Finally, you can clear recordings either from the page or from all pages. The I button takes you to our manual for more information. We have already covered many of the report generation features as we went through the acquisition since many of them can be used while you're acquiring. I highlighted many features of our pages and how they help improve workflow by making it easier to organize our recordings as we acquire. One other feature that was implemented is the ability to set up page attributes for our pages and save them. This is useful if you use page labels, as you can save page attributes including the time and amplitude scales, zoom size, and all the parameters you see when you right-click on page as part of your default or specific attributes. This will be useful when you click and manually move single recordings from one page to the next as the page attributes will already be set. This only needs to be set up once at setup, and if you're using our pediatric labels and attributes, you are all set. If you do not use the page attributes feature, then you will need to apply the page attributes to a page prior to manually moving data to a page. I mentioned earlier that you can add notes or text to the page by clicking on the notepad icon or by going to report, add text. You can also create text templates or modify one of our existing templates and add, which will speed up writing of the report. For those of you who use our OAE modules, you can also import the DPOAE and TEOAE results to one of the pages in SmartEP to have a more complete report. Before ending your session, even if you have not finalized your report, it is important to save your report. This will allow you to load up the report and all of your pages will populate as you had left them. You can continue working on them as well. To save a report, you can click on the Save Report icon or click on Report, Save Report. The report will already be saved in the patient record and so more commonly, our users use the date as the report name and save. To show how convenient it is to load a saved report, I will exit the software and relaunch. Now, I will load up my patient, then click on the load report icon. You can also go to report, load report for this, and select the report I saved a few minutes ago. Note that all of my pages are, are filled just as they were. This will save time, as you will not need to manually reload each recording when you are ready to print. You can continue working on the report, continue labeling, and resave under the same name or a different name. You can also clear all pages to start again another report from scratch. Now, when you are ready to print, I recommend printing a PDF preview or saving the report as a PDF file. I always like to do this so that I can see how the report will look before I print it. If you would like to change the logo and use your own logo on the report, please contact our technical support team and we'll be happy to guide you through the process. Thank you very much for taking the time to watch this training video. Please do not hesitate to contact us by calling our office or sending us an email. 
Our sales and support teams are available to assist you.